Welcome to a new edition of the Neon Jazz Interview Series with Canadian jazz producer, composer, lyricist, and book writer Andrew Melzer on the new 2021 CD releases. He continues to release seller recordings he has amassed over the years. His newest ones are from the Norm Amadio Trio, After Hours, circa 1966, and from the Heart and Soul recording in 1978, Diane Brooks. He talks about both of these recordings, the artist, and what it means for them to come out during this COVID-19 time in the world. Enjoy. So, hey, thanks for taking a minute out, man. I appreciate it. Oh, yeah. My pleasure. Thank you for listening. So you, you have two new CDs you produced that are out. Thank you for sending them. And I want to start off first and foremost with what we've been living through with COVID. What is it, what, what is it like for you to be able to give people music during this time where, you know, we really need it? Is well, we but, believe it or not, uh, uh, that was one of my motivations uh, way back in maybe March of, of 2020 that, you know, I'm sitting on all these fantastic masters and I've got to finish them off with, with some uh, mixing and mastering and artwork and get them out, you know, it, it, it's going to be ridiculously difficult to go into the studio with new stuff, so I, I might as well just work on what I have. That's what really got my my behind off the chair, you know, get things moving along. And the uh, first one was the Scat Man, and, and then I thought, okay, now after that, it's time for me to release uh, Norm's recording and, and Diane's as well because they were just so talented. Unfortunately, uh, all these three people are gone now and uh, some of the backup people too who played on the sessions are gone too. But but their artistry will never go away. Let's kind of talk about both of them a little bit to, to kind of give some texture here. And sure. the first one is Norman. Talk yeah. to me a little bit about, you know, uh, he was really prominent back in the day when, I mean, things were really swinging in the world of jazz, both up north and here in the States. Talk yes. to me a little bit about his impact and how you came across, how all of this culminated into this album. Uh, it's a wonderful story, Norman and I. I was a uh, very, very serious uh, a student, uh, a music student in in my in my teens. I I, I was studying violin for twelve years, uh, not when I was fourteen, but at at the end of my my studies it was twelve years of it. When I was about fourteen years old, uh, I asked my parents if I could go out to this after hour coffee place, and it was kind of safe to do that in Toronto at the time. We we're not that far from a subway. And it took me uh, to this area that had uh, these cafes. Norman was playing there, and he had already been pay playing that place now for eight years at that point. And I, I, I really got enamored by his music. And sometimes he'd have some great musicians from the States who were playing bars who'd come in and just join in. It was something else. So after following him, for a while, uh, I took up the nerve to ask him if he might consider uh, recording some of my music, and he said, "Well, bring me uh, some lead sheets and let me let me let me see what you got." So I did exactly that, and uh, I was 19 at the time. And then he said, "Okay, well, this is what th we can do. These uh, bring me anything more that you have." and we'll sort through it. And he told me what uh, the musicians' uh, union rates were and so on, and I knew already what the studio would cost, so I I put everything away. And and in 66, we went in the studio. I was uh, 20 years old, going to the Royal Conservatory. He was already playing this, this newer jazz club because... Uh, the other one had closed down. After one of his gigs, and I think it was a Saturday night, we went into the studio like around 3 in the morning, and they just laid down those six tracks within uh, within three hours. We might have taken 
little coffee and cigarette breaks in between, but uh, it was something else. I, I, I wish I would have had a camera, or better yet, video. It would have been great, but it was, it was wonderful. And he was a really big star in Canada. He had already played in, in a village in New York as well. They knew him down there. He was music director of several TV shows in Canada at that point. Uh, I, I just felt completely honored by having these uh, super talented people that I got to work with. Uh, little did I know that, I w that that was the best beginning for me as a producer because after that, I kept that going by, by always wanting to play with the best people, you know? How about Diane Brooks? How did, how did all of that, that relationship and this album come to life? Yes. Diane and I met, uh, I think, in 65. She was um, a member of a group called the Soul Searchers. And she and a gentleman named Eric Mercury, a very talented singer, uh, writer, and producer, they were the they were the vocalists, the lead vocal or the soul group, and I was just absolutely floored when I heard her voice. I mean, I have to say she was one of the best singers I've ever heard in my life. Especially if 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 you worked with her and and you saw how quickly she got everything, and and when it came to like harmony parts, how quickly she would get all of those, you know. So it was just absolutely fabulous. We didn't. We became friends, but we didn't get to to work together until we both moved to Los Angeles. When I had uh, the Scatman session, I immediately hired her to be one of the backup vocalists on that. And it was only like a a year later that we were in the studio with the first three tracks on her album. So that didn't take long, but I have to tell you, in the meantime, I saw her many, many times in live performances, and I saw her recording with uh, a fabulous group called Dr. Music, saw her uh, do uh, different ads and recordings for TV shows. Often they would do those in a studio. She just knocked me off my seat, I mean... Just a fabulous, fabulous singer she was. From these two releases, you know, in conjunction with the the, the other one, the, the earlier release, what are you hoping that the, the, the world of jazz listeners and fans get from these artists that maybe they haven't listened to or they didn't realize um, that they like them as much as they do? Well, I, I, I hope they get to listen to them because, because they might be different than any other recordings that, uh, from both of them that they might have heard before. Like I did another album with Norm in 2009, which was released in, in, in 2010, uh, called Norm Amadio and Friends. Uh, it was a completely different setup. Those, those were unbelievable uh, uh, studio jazz musicians, and we had charts and everything else. And this album was just the trio. They didn't really have charts. They were they they all had the lead sheet, but uh, that's it. So they were a little more open and they could play. And also, uh, we had that atmosphere of them going in the studio after a gig, you know. So that was a totally uh, different outcome than uh, a listener might have heard that on uh, other albums by them. Uh, with Diane, in fact, I just had a compliment from uh, a musician friend in Los Angeles who I shared uh, Diane's album with because he was also a close friend of hers. And he told me that out of all the recordings that she's done, that this might be the best. And she had deals with uh, MGM and Warner Brothers and a couple of other labels before that in the 60s. And... Uh, they just didn't capture uh, some of the aspects of, of Diane that we were able to do. Beautiful. Hey, Andrew, thank you for reaching out and sending the music. I'm going to look forward to 
profiling it on Neon Daz, and yeah, keep them coming. I love it. Thank you so much, and, and thank you so much for listening and for your interest, Joe. Thanks for listening and tuning in to another Neon Jazz interview, where we give you a bit of insight into the finest players and producers in Canada, Kansas City, and spots all over the world, giving fans all that jazz. Thanks to Andrew for his time, music, and story. If you want to hear more interviews, go to Famous Interviews with Joe Domino in the iTunes Store. Visit Neon Jazz at YouTube.com, and for everything Neon Jazz all the time, go to the neonjazz.blogspot.com. Until next time, enjoy the jazz, my friends. Neon Jazz.